Good. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Jackie Medcalf, and I am the Executive Director of Texas Health and Environment Alliance. Uh, I believe we have a couple of new people on the line. Um, tonight, we're going to be going into a bit of technical information uh, to talk about, you know, where we are and what's needed for where we're headed. And um, I'm really excited to share that with y'all, as well as um, the latest updates from the EPA. So um, tonight, uh, it's a webinar format. All of the lines are muted. If you have questions during the presentation um, and you want to drop them in the chat, please feel free to. At the end of the presentation, all lines will be unmuted. So you will definitely have an opportunity to unmute your line and engage that way if you'd wish. Um, and then also, I'm going to do my best to keep this meeting under one hour and be respectful of y'all's time. And I ask, you know, that you do the same to be respectful of, um, of your fellow community members time. So we're going to talk about the Jones Road Superfund site, which uh, this is it. Nothing fancy. It's uh, literally a shopping center. And um, the original dumping that made up this Superfund site uh, took place here in this corner unit right here behind this tree. Um, the time that this picture was taken, it was halal, uh, meat, uh, the halal market. Um, that is no longer there, um, but this is off of Jones Road and Barely Lane. So looking at it from a zoomed out view, it's definitely Northwest Harris County. It is, um, northwest of the Beltway in between 290 and 249. And I really like this map here on the left um, where you know, you're looking at a zoomed in view of the shopping center itself, the cross streets, and then you're able to see what's indicated in red is what was the former dry cleaner um, where this super fun site originated. All right, so this site has been ongoing for quite some time. And <clears throat> right now the site is in the remedial action phase of the Superfund process. So um, actual cleanup activities have been taking place for some time and um, they will likely go on for quite a bit longer. Okay, so, um, Next, we're going to talk about, uh, well, throughout the presentation, when we talk about the plume, I wanted to give you all a visual of, of what I'm talking about. So essentially, if we're looking at the, the graphic on the left here, um, there was the dry cleaner in the end unit of that shopping center, and they would dispose of their dry cleaning solvents out back or in stormwater drains. And um, indicated here by the yellow, showing that it makes its way into um, subsurface or underneath the ground and creates this plume of contaminants. Um, it's indicated here in these two graphics as PERC. That is the um, common acronym or nickname for these contaminants. And the graphic on the right gives you a better sense of how these contaminants can act when they're underground. So one, you see they're being released in this graphic from a source and they're migrating in the direction of the groundwater flow. They're then um, able to dissolve in the water, but also come up through the ground as vapors. They can come up through the ground and into the outdoor air or the ambient air, or they can come into our building structures, whether it's a home, the shopping center, or a different business or, or basically building structure in the area. Okay, so um, the February freeze did impact this site and um, it, the site was inspected on February 19th and um, we actually have not met in quite some time as just as a community to talk about this super fun site um, because of um, some items I have going on, some emergency items in February and the freeze. And um, this site though, you know, the EPA has been working on it and they first inspected it after the freeze on the 19th of February. Um, they found that there was equipment that was damaged 
and that there was um, piping that was also damaged and the damaged pipes resulted in um, a discharge of treated water near Barely Lane. I'll show you all some maps in a minute of the infrastructure and what we know. Um, for the soil vapor extraction system, it was inoperable from February 19th to February 23rd for the deeper zone. So the deepest parts of that contamination where they're extracting the gases and the contaminated groundwater, um, that was not out for very long. But the shallower extraction zones um, were not operable until April 8th. So that's a considerable amount of time. And to me, for the day in, day out consideration of human exposure, it's really the shallow um, contamination that, that is more concerning on the short term. Long term, absolutely, it's all concerning. The deeper aquifer contamination is absolutely um, very concerning, needs to be addressed. But the shallower contamination is what had, you know, what is closest to humans and animals, right? And so that's what is going to first, you know, potentially vaporize into our air, into our buildings. And so um, to me, it's really concerning that this equipment was not in operation for, I believe, over six weeks. So what we're looking at here is um, one of the engineering drawings for the shopping center and the soil vapor extraction system. Um, so again, looking at an aerial view of this L-shaped shopping center, the dry, original dry cleaner was in the, this end of the center that borders Jones Road. This is Barely Lane here. And um, all, of this, all of these lines represent the underground infrastructure that makes up the soil vapor extraction system. And it comes over to the east side of the shopping center to behind it and um, goes through a treatment process. And um, that's what you are seeing here. This is the little treatment facility that was constructed behind the shopping center. And going out to the right of that is the water line. And that's the water line that carries the treated water. Once it's already been extracted from the ground, it's been processed through this treatment facility, and then it is going back out to injection wells to be re-injected into the groundwater system. Um, that's the area that had the leak uh, for the treated groundwater. Now, as for where the other areas are, we're not sure. The EPA has not let on to that information yet. So we are still, you know, trying to figure out where exactly um, the other equipment is that was damaged and what exactly that equipment is. Looking at some of the potentially vulnerable places, um, you know, we looked at as much as we could of the treatment equipment to try to figure out like, what are the weak links? What are the points that might have been impacted? And so um, those lines that I was showing you that are underground feed into these lines that you are seeing here. And then they go into this metal unit. It's kind of like a, a shipping container, if you will. And inside of that is the treatment equipment. And so, um, as you can see, these lines here are insulated. The building itself, however, the insulation is probably less than like my home or your home. Your home has. It's um, it's not you know anything stellar. It's it's very minimal insulation. Um, not something that would typically withstand, you know, sustained freezing periods like we saw in February. I know it was an unusual event, but, you know, the bottom line is our climate is becoming more extreme. And I uh, don't think we're going to stop seeing these, you know, harsh freezes and um, first time events like that. So this is the, the unit here um, where you just saw those lines going into, again, like I said, it's literally just like a, a, sh a shipping container um, that's been built out. This isn't a view of the inside with um, the different 
um, filtration systems. And so the this SVE system is extracting the vapors and, and the air from underground as well as some of the groundwater. And so then it comes through these different points and it's filtered and then the air is exhausted the filtered air is exhausted back up into the open air outside. The water, however, um, goes out in a line to the east. And so we'll look at that in just a minute. In that process though, some of these tanks um, have to be utilized for storing material um, as part of filtration, part of the process. And so um, looking at this, you know, you can see right away some of these containers are insulated. So their weak points in a, in a strong freeze would maybe be, you know, just like we experienced those joints um, where there's a, a pipe joining another pipe, a pipe entering or exiting one of these um, containers, but then also you'll notice this bigger white um, tank here. That's definitely a weak point. Um, it does not appear that there is any kind of um, tray or any kind of barrier underneath this tank. Um, so if that tank were to have cracked, you know, um, it's definitely something that we would want that we would be concerned about you know what is in this tank is it the water before it's treated that would make sense because the treated water goes out this side of this unit so um we need to learn more about specifically what's going on in here and what was damaged out of this equipment that the epa has not been clear on what they have been clear on is that um this is the line right here like I said, coming out to the east, this is the uh, line that was impacted. Um, you know, it's probably a more shallow PVC like line that is carrying the treated water out from the um, treatment container. And then it, it forks out and it goes into injection wells. Um, there's two different ones that it goes to. And so um, that's where some of the water um, was released due to that. And um, all of those repairs were completed. The system is back up and operating. But now that leaves, you know, room for more of a conversation of what's being done to make sure this doesn't happen again. You know, what is taking place to prepare this unit for a loss of power, a freeze, a flood. And um, so I have asked the EPA if any of this is being looked at or talked about. And um, they said that they are looking at further weatherproofing for um, extreme weather events of this equipment. And so that would be both, you know, like a hurricane, a storm scenario, as well as, um, you know, a heat event, as well as a freezing event, like we experienced a couple months ago. I, in my opinion, I would like to see them um, have a public meeting and provide some of these updates. You know, local knowledge is so critical. And at the end of the day, the folks with the EPA who are working on the site, they're not here. They're in Dallas. And um, I think it's a good opportunity for them to be communicating with the public, with the community, um, and talking about, you know, some of these things they're considering and what they're looking at. So for the Superfund site as a whole, we're in a pretty critical point right now. You know, we have a really big opportunity this year and next year. And um, that's because the five-year review is taking place. So the five-year review um, takes place uh, kind of as indicated every five years um, until there no longer needs to be operations or maintenance at a Superfund site. And so, um, what the five-year review does is it looks at the record of decision, the, the remedy, the plan for cleanup, to assess whether or not what the EPA has laid out, what path forward for the cleanup um, that they've set, um, set forward on is adequate. If it's actually doing what it set out to do, if it's protective, if it is, um, if it's enough, or if other things need to be added. My opinion across the board is that it's not enough. And so um, in this presentation, we are going to go over, oops, hang on one second. I think I just, 
Uh, Tracy, are you recording? Yes. Okay, sorry, I didn't, I did not see the light. I was like, oh no, because this is really important information um, that I'm about to share. So um, let's see, we're going to go through and briefly touch on the main points um, of this super fun site that could potentially be pathway, uh, pathways of exposure to humans. And we're also going to talk about um, public health. So first, um, we'll talk about the outdoor air, and you're going to see a theme here. It's that we need more testing. We need more done. So um, first, we'll talk about the outdoor air. We're going to touch on the indoor air, the sub slab sampling, but which is beneath the shopping center's uh, cement slab foundation. We're going to talk about the groundwater. And um, then, like I said, we'll go into public health and um, keeping in mind, as we talk about these different items, um, we know that our elected officials are going to need to be engaged and updated on our position in this, right? So this is a super, this is an orphan super fun site. So it really lacks objectivity because the only ones working on it are the EPA and their contractors. And so, um, we want to make sure that we are commenting during this five-year review period where they're assessing if what they're doing is adequate and then also make sure that our elected officials have our unbiased opinions and then they with that information they can advocate to the agencies as well and uh, marlene i know you are on thank you very much i know marlene was in communication with some of our elected officials um, recently Okay, so for the outdoor air quality, um, it's there's a gray area. And, and the gray area is that the EPA leans on the states for outdoor air quality standards for these contaminants. And I think we can all understand why that's not always the best thing here in Texas. So um, what you're seeing in this chart is what was found by the EPA when they did outdoor air sampling near the shopping center from 2015 to 2018 and comparing those levels of PCE, TCE, and vinyl chloride, three of the contaminants from this site, to other states' standards to see if we were in another state and not in Texas, would this be a big deal? And, uh, you know, what we see is, yes, it would be. Um, but here in Texas, it is not. And so um, to give you an idea, EPA found, you know, in, in the outdoor air, PCE at 4.21 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, according to California, their, their limit is 0 0.46. Going across the other ones highlighted in pink are states as well that um, the value found here in the outdoor air around the shopping center would exceed what these other states would allow um, or prompt a response. So um, then you can see for TCE, um, you have four out of the five um, in exceedance uh, for four out of five of the other states. And for vinyl chloride, you have um, five for five in exceedance of all of these different states here that we're looking at. And um, vinyl chloride is the final product that, that PCE breaks down into over time. And it is just as toxic, if not even more toxic than um, the original product PCE. Um, it is something that can cause um, liver toxicity and other health issues at, at pretty small doses. And so um, it's definitely something that we need to be looking out for and concerned about. Okay, indoor air at the shopping center. So to the best of my knowledge, um, the first time the indoor air was sampled was in 2015. That's from the data I've seen, from the reports I've seen. Um, so in 2015, they sampled it and it showed unsafe levels. In 2017, they sampled the indoor air again in the shopping center. Mind you, all of this indoor air sampling only took place in the first three units of the shopping center. 
where the original dry cleaner was and the next two bordering units. My, I believe there's under 10 units that operate within the shopping center and they've only tested the first three. So in 2017, it showed a significant increase in the concentrations of these contaminants in the indoor air. Um, they actually found the contaminants between 144 and 269 micrograms per meter uh, cubed when the minimal risk level is 41. So quite a bit higher than what the risk level is, and that's the level that prompts a government response. So in the sub slab, um, they found over 4 million micrograms per meter cube. That's really, really high. And why that's concerning, because the next place for it to go is into the building. So um, these contaminants can make their way through a cement slab. And then when they get inside, they harbor, they, they tend to harbor in that indoor air. If there's an AC system running, it can recirculate these contaminants. So you wind up with a, a, a very serious situation when we're talking indoor air compared to outdoor air, where it can break down quicker in the outdoor air. Also, you know, um, rise, move away, go in the direction of the wind, but in all, any of that in the outdoor air winds up as breaking down of these contaminants, whereas indoor, it tends to harbor and, and keep increasing in its con concentration. So they found in this sub slab over 4 million micrograms per meter cubed. That's astronomical. So um, as a result of these 2017 results, the EPA, a year later, installed vapor extraction systems in these first three units. They retested the indoor air. The contaminants of concern were um, below that risk level of 41. And um, problem there though, is that one, they did not resample the sub slab. So um, it's important that, you know, we have this data and these samples over time because these can, types of contaminants can vary as they rise up, right? 2015 showed lower levels than 2017. And so they change, you know, day in and day out and seasonally as well. If you're sampling in a warmer month, you would expect these concentrations to be higher than in a cooler month because they more rapidly react when it's hot. Um, so we need to see sub, sub slab sampling and we need to see more of the shopping units tested. This goes against every basic fundamental component of sampling. Uh, when you find a problem, you don't stop. When you find a problem, you keep sampling until you don't find the problem anymore. So they found this unsafe situation in the first three units. What about the fourth? It's safe. They share a wall. They share a slab. They might even share an AC. I'm not sure. So um, we need more sampling of the indoor air and the sub slab. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the groundwater component. I was going through an interesting document earlier, and um, one of my team members is going to drop that in the chat. And I wanted to share this with y'all. It's a document from years and years ago, and um, like the early 2000s. And um, it says here in December of 2000, during a routine sampling of public wells by TCEQ's Houston office, PCE, DCE, and chloromethane were detected in public water supply well, uh, specific public water supply well in the Jones Road area. The public uh, water supply well supplied water to a gymnastics school and a child care facility with 18 employees, 90 children in child care, and 150 to 200 gymnastics students. This is the first time I've seen these numbers. I knew that this Superfund site was discovered um, as a result of contamination being found in a gymnastics and a childcare facility um, nearby. But what is, what is the health like of those 18 employees? And employees ebb and flow over time, right? So others who have worked there. Um, what about the children, the 90 children who are in childcare at that time, 150 to 200 gymnastics students? Children are most susceptible to these contaminants. 
and it would be really good to uh you know be able to come in contact with some of these folks and so um for our community members you know if you know children or adults um from that were in the area during this time that might have gone to this center or worked at this center, you know, please ask them to take our health survey. Please get them in contact with us because um, they might not have known that this exposure was going on. And um, it's pretty important that folks can understand their health. All right. Okay, the other item I wanted to show you all from this document before we look at some maps. So um, in March and April of 2002, um, TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, collected samples from 43 drinking supply wells. They found concentrations of PCE in the groundwater samples in some of the wells. The highest concentration was 128 parts per billion. As a result, filtration systems were placed on eight wells. Okay, so they put a filtration system on eight wells. They tested 43 wells and they found that um, some of those wells had the PCE and the contaminants in their water. The highest value was 128 parts per billion. The max amount that's allowed from, this, from the federal government in, in drinking water is five. So five parts per billion is the max. And they found 128 parts per billion. So this was almost 20 years ago. We're talking about, it is time to get this done right. It, it, it cannot go another 10, 20 years. I mean, it's just ridiculous, you know, that, yeah, these were the early years of, of discovery, but still here we are over 20 years later and we don't have a very good situation. Um, so let me explain about that. On the EPA's website right now, they have this statement. Providing an alternative drinking water source to the community is an integral strategy to protect human health, as well as conduct, uh, as well as conduct future remediation and restoration of the Chicote Aquifer. Continuous use of private water wells may inhibit the effectiveness of aquifer restoration. Yet there are hundreds and probably thousands of local groundwater wells in operation right now at this moment near this site. So for the Superfund site here on one hand, the EPA is saying, you know, providing an alternate source, not continuing to pull from the local groundwater is imperative, let's say not only to protect human health, but also so that they can effectively remediate the aquifer. But the wells have not been adequately restricted. And so this is going to be one of the biggest points we talk about in our comments on their five-year review. Um, they need to be doing more here. So um, when we had a team go door to door earlier this year, or it might've been last year, actually, during the pandemic, um, they found that a lot of the residents in this area said they've never heard from the EPA. People who've lived here for 20 and 30 years. So they've never heard from them. So one, we need better outreach. Um, so looking here at the area, right here is where the Superfund site is. In red is one of the drilling restrictions. And then the dashed black line is one of the other drilling restrictions. So as part of the remedy, the EPA put, uh, put these two drilling restrictions, ones with the county and ones with the state, on groundwater wells in this area. So under this restriction, no new groundwaters should, or groundwater wells should be drilled in this area. But we know from talking to people who live in this area, there are still groundwater wells being drilled. It's simply a matter of the wild west in the drilling industry. It's drillers drilling wells, not permitting them and not registering them. And the homeowner more times than not is none the wiser. You know, a lot of us don't know about these, these things that 
you know, the person we hire to do a job should be doing and should be looking out for, right? You come, you drill a well, you should be adequately uh, registering that well with the drillers uh, department, but, but they're not. And so that's how they're getting away with it. And um, so one, that puts public health at risk because someone might be unknowingly pulling these contaminants into their home or watering their garden with them. Um, and two, it is impact, it has the potential to impact the flow of the plume of contamination. So taking another look at this map, the, um, you can see here down to the parcel level, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure how big all of your screens are, but, um, if you can see, um, you, it gets down to the parcel level. So you see these little boxes, right? And some of them are still that. Um, you know, color of the of the trees, of the shrubs, the, the, of the map um, from the aerial view. Those are parcels. You see quite a few down here where the neighborhood is more dense. Um, those are parcels where the homeowner was never contacted. So out of the parcels where the homeowner was contacted, um, the orange ones decided the property owner, um, cause like some of these are businesses, um, the property decided not to go on city infrastructure. So these are, we know still on groundwater wells, the ones that are blue were contacted and agreed to go on city water, uh, which is about half. So about half of the people contacted, um, are on city water and about half are not. But what about all these other people? So <clears throat> you have a, a two-part problem here. One, the restriction's not working and something, there needs to be a course correct because that part of the rod, that part of the remedy <clears throat> is not adequately being addressed. Um, and, and then two, there needs to be more intense outreach from the agency in this area to get people off of wells. Um, I know people often don't want a water bill and they think, oh, my water's fine. Um, <clears throat> but it's the EPA's duty to look out for public health. And um, we know that there's a, a very serious risk here. So talking about, you know, these, these risks to public health, what do we know about, about the community's health? Well, we have a health survey that we host on our website, and um, we have been seeing quite a bit of MDS, leukemia, urinary cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, and we've been seeing a variety of different types of cancers and autoimmune diseases being reported to us. We've also seen some Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's and these contaminants go hand in hand. Um, it's, it's very common for you to see the two neighboring. And so um, we have, you know, a small understanding of the area's health of what we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> However, there was a group of parents in the area uh, that had asked Texas Department of State Health Services to look into childhood leukemia because they felt that the rates at Hamilton Elementary School of childhood leukemia were abnormal. They just felt like too many kids there were, were battling leukemia. And so um, Texas Department of State Health Services looked into a seven census tract area. This area though, however, borders where the Jones Road Superfund site is. So this cancer data is not necessarily for immediately at the Superfund site, it's just to the north of that area. And so um, on this map here, you see the census tracts in blue that the state looked into. And um, just for a point of reference, this green blob right here, that's Longwood Country Club or Golf Course. So um, you can see Longwood's way up here, the Superfund site is down here. Um, and it is between 249 and uh, 290 over here. So what they found for this area is that um, from 2010 to 2006, 
2016, childhood leukemia diagnosis in this area was over two times the state's average, over two times what you would expect to see in the average Texas community. So we need one, the study area to be expanded, and we need more types of cancer to be looked at by the state. So at Thea, we have launched a health survey initiative where we are attempting to saturate the communities that we work in so that we can get more information about the types of cancer that are plaguing our communities so that we can ask Department of State Health Services to look into those cancer types. Um, this is a video that we have on our social media. If you are on social media, um, I ask that you share this information um, because you might know someone who lives in the area, someone maybe who went to the gymnastics facility or someone who frequents this area. And if we're not hearing from them, if we're not hearing about the types of disease that is plaguing the community, we won't know to ask for it to be looked at. And the state's definitely not going to be looking at it. You know, we have to ask for cancer types to be looked at. It's easy to make excuses for our health problems, such as our lifestyle or our diet. But when we're looking at the bigger picture and we think about what we share in common in our communities, it's our environment, it's our land, our air, and our water. So we need to hear from you. The more surveys we collect, the better our chances of understanding the relationship between the contaminants in your environment and the health of your community. This health survey is located on our website. Please take it today. And with our collective experiences, we will be able to create the change that our communities desperately need. So we have this video up um, now. It's easy to make excuses and we're going to be um, rolling out more videos, more information as we go. Um, but you saw in that video when what it looks like on our website. So we now actually also have the survey available in Spanish. So I'm really excited about that. Our team was able to get that up within the last week. And so um, now um, right there on our website where you would usually click for community health survey, um, it gives you the option English or Spanish. Um, other, uh, other things we're doing to address the laundry list you saw under the five-year review of need more testing, need more information, as we're leveraging our partnership with um, University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, you guys have heard me talk about this for some time now, um, but we have been meeting with them and um, looking at what we know and um, looking at what we know and then where we need to go from there based off of that. Are there gaps in the data? Are there gaps in what's known? From what I've shown you today, every area of this remedy, in our opinion, has flaws. You know, um, <clears throat> my background is in environmental geology and environmental science. Um, I am not a toxicologist, uh, but my background is in science. And so, you know, working with toxicologists, working with people who have expertise in these specific areas just makes us that much stronger. And so um, we have a partnership where um, we are working with researchers, um, toxicologists, and all different types of scientists and uh, medical experts at UTMB. And one of the things we're working on is they are actually in the process of purchasing um, a GCMS um, sampling equipment, sampling and analysis equipment. And that's extremely exciting because that's a very high tech, very, very expensive piece of equipment that, you know, we at a small organization could never, uh, maybe one day, but we don't have the means for that. And what this piece of equipment will allow us to do is go out in the field with the researchers, go out in the community, go out near the shopping center and in real time, test the soil, the water and the air. So in real time, we're gonna be able to collect data that helps fill these gaps. And so um, that's really, really exciting. And the time is now, right? We're in this critical time where we have asked the EPA to do more indoor air sampling. We have asked them to redo subslab. We've asked them to do outdoor air sampling. And we've asked them to do more groundwater sampling. And we keep they keep coming up with excuses. And these things aren't getting done. And so it's time to take the matter into our own hands. And um, fortunately, our partners at UTMB are uh, there for us. 
and I'm pretty excited about it. Um, they are also providing us with an expert review of the EPA material up to up till now. So we uh, received about 400 documents and a Freedom of Information Act request. Our team has gone through those. We believe we have our understanding of um, kind of what's needed from there, where some holes are um, in the data, where there's gaps in the data. Um, and then now the experts at UTMB are going to go through this data also with a fine tooth comb and provide us their opinion of what they think is needed based off of what's there and what is not there. Um, we also have put in a uh, another Freedom of Information Act request based off of what we um, saw in the 400 documents we received. Um, we found that we were not uh, that we were missing the latest uh, groundwater sampling. So the groundwater sampling that's taken place in the last uh, about year was not in uh, that package of, of documents. And so we are waiting response right now to get our hands on that data. What we saw in the groundwater data was absolutely concerning. Um, they are finding contaminants from this site. They, the, the EPA believes from this site um, in the 1960 Jones Road area. So it's definitely migrating south, southeast, um, which at the end of the day tells us this site is not in control. It's not in control. It's migrating off site and there's people in that path. And so um, we are, you know, making our way through this. And then ultimately, in looking at public health and trying to understand what is the health of the community today, what has it been in, in the past, um, we're going to be doing a door-to-door -door effort above the plume where, so essentially in that drilling restricted area I showed you, we're going to be doing a door-to-door -door event on May 8th. Um, so if you are interested in volunteering, uh, I think there was something in the chat about volunteers. Um, we need volunteers. We're going to be partnering with UTMB on this item, and they are going to provide us with, um, with some of their grad students who are, um, you know, studying to be medical doctors, studying to be toxicologists and experts in these um, arenas. And um, so we're teaming up with them to go door to door on May 8th. And um, if you are available, it would be later that afternoon. And um, we would love to have your assistance. Okay. Um, if you don't have my contact information, um, my email is here, as is our office phone number and our general email um, address. I, um, uh, I will actually be going on maternity leave um, in June. And so, um, you know, you feel free to continue contacting me, but there's also our general information there. Um, if you should reach out and maybe you don't get an immediate response from me, um, there's the additional contact information. I can assure you we are working seven days a week to make sure that all of these efforts keep rolling and that the team keeps moving and keeps pushing forward with all of this information um, while I'm on maternity leave. So our plan with um, the health survey initiative is that we are going to submit our request to Department of State Health Services um, in the end of May. And then um, once we submit that request, hopefully the state will move on that request and that we will then have reports produced by them in the fall. That's the ideal timeline. If we can get reports from the state per our request on their investigation into specific cancer types in the area, then we will, we will be presenting that information to y'all hopefully in the fall. Um, so that's really our goal. We wanna get it done by the fall so that it can get included in this five-year review. You know, sure, the EPA will look at it later, but if we could get it included in this body of work that the agency is doing now, um, then that would be very powerful. All right, so that is um, what I have for y'all today. Now I'm gonna open up the lines and um, talking will be allowed. And I would love to hear from you, um, thoughts, comments, concerns, 
tips. <laughs> I'd love to hear any of it. Do you have a date for when you'll start the door-to-door um, -door so that legislators can be participating? Oh, great question. Um, <clears throat> we will be going door-to-door -door May 8th. So that's where planning um, a large outreach event with UTMB that day. Okay. Will there be a formal invitation or will you have an ad or something that we can share? Sure, I, I can absolutely get y'all something. We had sent something over to uh, UTMB for them to put out for their grad students or their med okay. school students. Um, and we can absolutely get something to you, Marlene. Okay, thank you. Rachel, will you take note for us to um, make sure that we follow up with Marlene and get her something? Um, advertising for the volunteers for that event. Have you compiled a list of what type of cancers you're searching for? I have. Well, 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 we want to know all types of cancer. Right. Yeah. So I do have a list of what we've been seeing out there. Um, but I can't imagine that that's it, you know? Um, you know, the community I came from, we're a cancer cluster. And we, we handed over to the state 17 types of cancer that we commonly saw in our door-to-door -door surveys. And the state came back with 14 of those in abnormal rates. Like we never would have imagined that. And so when you do these things, you can kind of open up a can of worms, you know? And so all that the state's looked at so far is childhood leukemia, that's it. And it's not even for the neighborhood, you know, above the plume. And so um, we're definitely going to submit everything that we're seeing in our health surveys, but we want to exhaust all of the hundreds of types of cancer out there if possible. Do you have a one pager type already prepared? So when people go door to door, if they come upon somebody who is totally clueless, that they will have something to follow up with? And um, do you mean, um, in terms of medical or in terms of the super fun site? So, well, the reason that you're going door to door and doing a health survey, if somebody hasn't been paying attention and if they're a new resident. Yeah, no, we will absolutely have information to leave okay. with the residents. So we'll have a fact sheet. Um, it's a front and back fact sheet for the super fun site. And then um, kind of one of the next steps with UTMB is um, they right now they are writing um, emergency response grants because they believe that we're going to find some scenarios with the monitoring um, that's going to need more testing and, and more effort. And so they're writing some emergency response grants to have those ready for when we start that testing and we start the door to door to where then they can quickly turn around and get like a um, 15 or 30 day turnaround um, in a grant so that then we can do more outreach and whatever testing, you know, is shown to be needed. Um, because <clears throat> one thing that they said that I really appreciated and I really valued was that <clears throat> we don't want to go out there and find things and not be ready to tell the community what can be done you know, not be able to tell the community what that can mean for their health. And so one of the, one of the components of that that UTMB is working on is um, setting, getting doctors in place, getting physicians in place to where, you know, if, if, if this, you know, these contaminants are found at a person's property or a person's home or what, what have you, that they, that we have resources in hand ready for that person. So we're not just like giving them this scary information and then just like letting them sit with that, you know? So um, there's definitely in the future going to be, um, you know, physicians as well on hand, ready to talk with people about what this could mean. Have you contacted the neighborhood newsletters for their um, subdivisions? Or do you even have a contact sheet for that? I don't have a contact sheet for that. That's a really good idea. The only newspaper in the area that I was aware of was the Community Impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there are, I, I'm not aware um, if there are like any kind of 
um, neighborhood groups or anything like that in the area? Do you know of any more? All HOAs have a newsletter for their residents or okay. all active HOAs. So okay. I'll be, I'll ask around. Okay, and, and we can do that too. I, um, myself or some of my team members, um, we can call some of the specific contacts that are in those neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, and, and see as well. Good point, thank you. And that would be a good place for an ad for volunteers too, since it would be very close. Although they don't have the medical expertise, but they would be good volunteers. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, there's some high school groups that are science clubs and things like that. That might be also a, a good pool to draw from if you need, find that you need more volunteers. Okay. Okay. The local, okay. The local science clubs. Nice. That's great. That's a good, and, you know, I know in um, <clears throat> some of our other communities, some of our volunteers are local boy scouts. Uh -huh. Um, they'll, you know, they help us with things in the community, like right. putting up signs and, and taking flyers and things like that. So that's also something that we could look right. into. I think, I'm not sure whether that area is partially Matsky or Adam Elementary. So okay. there are Boy Scouts at both, and Girl Scouts at both schools. Good point. Yeah, good point. Okay, excellent. And Marlene, did you, um, were you able to, st to talk with um, some of the representatives in the area about the freeze? I talked to the staff members. To their and, staff members? Yes, and uh, had long conversations and then they followed up with the EPA. Excellent, excellent. Good. So uh, Representative Harless is aware of it. And as a matter of fact, Representative Oliverson introduced a bill today about um, people with uh, low insurance coverage, that there'd be a study done looking at environmental and other health conditions that impact a person's health. So that wow. bill was in the committee hearing Health and Human Services today in the House. Wow, fantastic. That's so exciting. I did, I did comments and uh, testimony on that one. Nice. Um, what was the bill number on that? Okay. I'll have to look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you mean you don't I'll have it on the top of your head? <laughs> um, I've asked me how many I've done today. <laughs> That's oh, I, I, I so appreciate it. Well, yeah, I'd love to uh, put a tracker in to follow that and, and see how that does. Um, there's actually a study that came out very recently from the University of Houston from Hanadi Rafai. She's done a lot of studies um, related to our work on the east side of town, um, where I come from, related to the dioxin and PCB exposure out there. And um, looking at Superfund sites, though, more generally, um, and how that actually takes time off of a person's life. Um, I think it was, you know, just kind of the standard ratio was like a, a couple of months. Um, but then when you factor in some of these demographic or socioeconomic factors, like not, not adequate healthcare, um, and then it's actually quite a bit longer that they found in this study. Okay, it's House Bill 4365 by Oliverson. And it's to establish a pilot to address the non-medical factors that contribute to poor health outcomes and higher health care costs among Medicaid enrollees. Non-medical factors and social drivers of health will include the ability to live and work in a healthy, safe environment, eat nutritious, affordable foods, avoid and escape interpersonal violence, pursue economic and educational opportunities, and obtain timely local health care services so amazing all right <laughs> awesome great that's exciting that's exciting i'll have to be following that one for sure it's about time <laughs> <laughs> excellent anything else that the league can do that might help that you can think of yeah, 
Um, let's see, I, I appreciate that. So, you know, if you guys wanted to echo um, when we formalize our comments on the five-year review, if you guys wanted to echo that or, you know, even help us get that out to, you know, the elected officials, okay. um, you know, that if we're standing in parallel or side by side on it, even some of the things will be stronger. Okay. And you said that'll be out this September? Um, we will like we we plan to have that out by the end of the year. Okay. It'll be so, after the redistricting special session then. Yes. We're calling a re yes, because the census data is not out yet officially. Yes, so then it would be after that. And um, that's something that um, I would be happy for you to keep us in the loop in <laughs> about um, how that, you know, how the cookie crumbles around this super fun site. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. I know. I just saw that I right on. The monopol I didn't want to monopolize the questions. I'm sorry. That's all right. Does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments before we conclude tonight's meeting? All right. I'm not seeing anything more in the chat or the Q&A. Um, all right. All right then, well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, thank you for your engagement and um, we will see y'all in May. We have our next meetings coming up in May and um, everybody on this call will receive email updates about that and you should also receive phone calls. Um, so I hope everyone has a good night. Thanks again for joining.